Vice President Harris is back in Washington this morning after completing her two-day bus tour in Georgia. She held a rally in Savannah yesterday and called herself the underdog in the race. So we want to take the pulse of the race. Uh, let's bring in uh, our political panel, Leslie Sanchez and Joel Payne. Leslie is a CBS News political analyst and a Republican strategist. Joel is a CBS News political contributor, Democratic strategist, and chief communications officer for Move On. All right, so I actually do want to start with um, the interview on CNN yesterday. And Joel, I want to ask you, and then I'll ask you a similar question, obviously, Leslie. But Joel, I want to ask you, what was it that Kamala Harris and her running mate needed to do yesterday, and did they accomplish it with that interview? Well, what she needed to do was continue the process of reintroducing herself to the American people. Of course, she's not an unknown person. People know the name Kamala Harris, but they don't really know coming into this process over the last six weeks who she is politically. She did a good job of laying out per perimeters of who she is politically at her convention and in the lead up to the convention. And I think this interview gave deeper opportunity for people to understand her governing philosophy, the fact that she will be pragmatic, the fact that her values are unchanged on things where it might seem like she held a different position previously, but her position is similar. The solutions that she's seeking are different. That type of work was able to be done in this interview, I think in a really effective way. And I think it positioned the vice president as someone who is very much um, identifiable with the American experience. The American people do not mind when politicians change their mind on a thing, as long as there is a reason to it and a rationale to it, and it can be demonstrated to improve their life. And I think Kamala Harris did that very difficult thing in that interview. Um, that is not the last test that she'll face in that realm, but I think she did a, uh, an exceptional job in the interview uh, that we saw last night. All right, Leslie, same question. What did she need to do? Did she accomplish it? I don't know that Joel and I watched the same debate, you know, same interview <laughs> in context. I, I'd say that what, what voters are looking for is someone to remove the veneer of the candidate, to really fundamentally understand what they believe in. Is she in charge of the campaign or is the campaign in charge of her? And what that means is a, there's a lot of artifice and pageantry of, around rolling out a new presidential candidate. She's on scripted speeches, like you saw the, at the Democratic convention. Uh, she's, in, you know, with teleprompters everywhere she goes. But this is a one-on-one -on -one to really look at a lot of the flip-flops that could marvel the summer gymnastics uh, in the Olympics. And they wanted to talk about fracking and border security, inflation, and see where and how she held her administration accountable. And I think to some extent, uh, some of those answers uh, w left voters wanting more, um, especially with the economy. When you think about 9.1% in, uh, inflation under the Biden-Harris administration, where was the response to that? And I like the idea of opportunity economy, but what exactly does that mean? If you remember, uh, George W. Bush talked about opportunity conservatism, and it took a lot of time to articulate that to voters. So kind of some of these broad efforts of trying to swipe away at a previous record and previous statements, it's really difficult to get away from. And I think that's going to be the challenge for any interview moving forward. Well, see, I did find it interesting that she said that she would put a Republican in her cabinet. What, what was your take on that? team arrivals. I think that's something that other administrations have talked about in the past. And what it does, it's the olive branch to the other side. It's saying, it's signaling, I'm willing to be open. I'm willing to find compromise. I think on both sides of the aisle, you've, you've heard even uh, you know, former President Trump talk about that yesterday when he's saying, you know, I support the idea of private insurers providing IVF coverage or the government paying for IVF coverage. It's this move of trying to get those voters who feel that there is that the lines are so hard on each side that there isn't compromise like there needs to be in Washington. And it's up to the voters to determine if that's going to fundamentally work for them. Joel, yeah, Anne Marie, the problem the, the problem with that, and you know, uh, you know, uh, Leslie's my, my friend here, but the problem with what she's saying here is about Donald Trump, him talking about uh, IVF. It doesn't line up with his platform, which, of course, has the fetal personhood amendment, which is it, directly at odds with what he said about IVF. J.D. Vance voted against the principles that he allegedly laid out about IVF. And even some of his positioning on abortion yesterday, talking about how he would vote against, or no, he didn't actually say he would vote against the measure in Florida. He said he thought six weeks wasn't enough, but then his campaign had to walk it back later. So what we're talking about here is expectations 
um, and what voters are going to give these candidates space to do. I think voters expect candidates to evolve and to grow. What they don't like is pandering, and what they don't like is ingenuine pan uh, disingenuous pandering. And I think you've seen that from Trump recently. You haven't really seen that from Kamala Harris. Yes, she's evolved, but it fits within the narrative of the story she's telling. It doesn't fit within the narrative of the story that Donald Trump is telling. And that's what these campaigns are going to be fighting over the next two months. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I haven't gone to sort of the, the Trump fans website to see if there's anything about the, you know, on their platform, you know, explaining their platform. But it did sort of feel like that IVF came out of nowhere with little explanation as to how you would pay for something quite that expensive. But Leslie, let me ask you this. There's been sort of a question with this kind of this is a this is a very curious race, right? There's been a question about who is more of an incumbent in this race. Uh, Trump last night tried to. Uh, Try to tie Harris, obviously, to President Biden. I want to play some of what he said. She's been there for three and a half years. She only wants to talk about the future because the past has been so... The job they've done, let me tell you, he's the worst president in the history of our country, and she's the worst vice president. Um, you know, even last night in, in the interview, there were questions about, well, you know, if these are if the, if these are your policies, you had four years to do it. And I thought, well, she was the vice president and not the president. And I, and I think the audience is sophisticated enough to get that. But I want to ask you, do you think this is sort of a winning argument for the former president to make? You know, there's the interesting part of that argument is if she says, I stand alone on my own policies, my values, what I believe, they are to the left of President Biden. Right, we know her entire professional career. She is extremely progressive, picking up these kind of uh, West Coast liberal policies in California on every issue from the economy, the role in government regulation, taxes, taxing the wealth, border, you know, providing uh, everything from driver's licenses, decriminalizing undocumented immigrants. I mean, it, the list goes on and on. To, to to swing back to the middle, saying I'm, you know, Biden Harris administration. I am responsible for this. I take on these policies. But then to run away and say, well, I really wasn't in control, even though I was the last person in the room. The duplicity of that. I mean, it just takes, I need a, a, a pad and paper, you know, I need to write down the map uh, to understand <laughs> what she was involved in, what she was not involved in. And that's the trouble in a compressed election cycle is people are really trying to peel the onion and understand what are we buying here for the future. And it's a difficult task um, and despite all that, she is on par. She's picked up the rest of the Democrats, and some of the never Trumpers have come on her side. So it just shows you the difficult task ahead. But on the issues of border and the issues of economy, she's going to have a very difficult time saying she was not part of the problem. So I'll give you the final word. Yeah, I just think the fact that um, I think Republicans are misreading this, the situation. I think Donald Trump is misreading it. Joe Biden, people liked his ideas and they liked the tone of governance that he set. What they didn't like was that he was old. <laughs> That's what they didn't like. They didn't like that, that Joe Biden was old. They made that clear. You know what else voters don't like? Donald Trump is old and is talking about the past and wants to take the country backwards. So I think Republicans are misreading this. No, did voters think that Joe Biden had every great idea and has every result been what they want? No, but they like the tone of governance. And I think Kamala Harris is reading the electorate correctly that there is space for her to continue some of the Biden-Harris approach to governing with tweaking some of the outcomes and some of the solutions. She's talking about doing that. Donald Trump is talking about going backwards. That's a contrast that the Harris campaign likes. All right, Leslie, Joel, thank you so much, guys. Have a great long weekend.